It's been two years since my first video about the 2017 Dell XPS 15. I love this thing. It's sleek lines, gorgeous display and good performance relative to its portability and age. But one of my PCs had to go and this is the one I decided would be the least difficult to part with. That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. My Dell Model 9560 was the machine that changed my mind about laptops. So now I need to change my own mind about the Dell. Maybe I'm biased, but I think the XPS 15 is a modern classic, as iconic a laptop design as anything ever made by a company that wasn't Apple. The slim bezel and tapered body design aren't unusual anymore, but Dell's own design language hasn't changed a whole lot since 2015. Why fix what isn't broken? If you want a reasonably cheap Windows laptop that makes you look good while replying to emails at the coffee shop, this one's definitely for you. That being said, there's still plenty that could be improved upon. My version has the 4K display, which is bright and crisp, with one of the better touchscreens of the era, but it can also double up as a mirror. You'll also probably want to turn the resolution down if you're moving away from mains power, as the battery life isn't great even in optimal conditions. The webcam is awkwardly placed, though to be fair, I've never used it. The keyboard is fine, but then again, I haven't had the biggest sample size of laptops to compare with, and I know people like a chair leg haven't had the best experience with it. The trackpad is a joy to navigate with, but clicking could be better. I tend to tap to left click and two finger tap, stop it, to right click rather than actually pressing down. I picked up my 9560 in 2018 from a secondhand store for an unspeakable bargain price. £550 was about a third, almost a quarter of the MSRP, but the store had misidentified the drive as being a 1TB hard drive instead of an SSD, and missed the fact that it had the 4K touch display. As well as having that excellent 2160p display and a still respectable 1TB NVMe drive, the other specs were pretty high-end for a 2017-era laptop, and were still good by the standards of 2018. The quad-core 8-thread i7-7700HQ was one of the best mobile CPUs available at the time, although the specs on paper would suggest it was a high-performance desktop replacement type chip, Dell's TDP limits would put a damper on any ambitions I had to get the thing doing serious work. Extended periods of Photoshop and Lightroom editing could result in a bug where the CPU would get stuck at Pentium 3 speeds. This was a real shame, as the 32 gigs of RAM would have been more than adequate for working with large RAW, TIFF and PSD documents, but the bug occurred frequently enough that it put me off using the laptop for anything more stressful than typing up scripts, watching movies and, recently, capturing footage for my YouTube channel. To aid in this, I use an EasyCap 321 USB capture card plugged in between the test PC and the monitor, with OBS capturing using the NVENC encoder on the Dell's built-in GTX 1050. This 4GB mobile version of the low-end Pascal GPU comes in handy for capturing gameplay from other PCs, but as to whether it can help the Dell game of its own accord, well, that's what I'm going to find out today. Spoiler, I'm selling the laptop for a reason, you know. Starting off light, I guess, Spider-Man Remastered acquits itself admirably on this pretty low-end gear, managing a 45 FPS average at 1080 low. However, with anti-aliasing disabled, the jagged edges look pretty rough. I found adding FSR quality to the medium preset to be a good compromise, with roughly the same average FPS and slightly reduced 1%. God of War, on the other hand, did not go well. 1080 anything was a write-off, and even dropping to 900p original started well enough, but didn't stay that way. Averages were an acceptable enough 29, but lows dropped into the teens. Dropping resolution to 720p brought it up to a near constant 30fps. However, in order to make this video, I was plugged into an external display, and Windows didn't know what to do with itself and refused to allow me to change desktop resolutions and this game only runs at lower than native res in a window. Uncharted 4 does slightly better. Again, native 1080 is out of the question, and although I wanted to try out FSR, the buggy desktop resolution business struck again, and I could only use basic scaling. 
and again, I was stuck playing in a window. Still, at 720p, resolution scaling wasn't needed. The Dell managed to run at a near 37fps average and 31% lows. I'm sure you won't be surprised to hear that Forza Horizon 5 performed pretty well, even without dropping to potato settings. At native 1080 with a medium preset and FXAA, the Dell can manage about 47 FPS with lows just below 40. While the Jaggies weren't all that terrible, once more it's possible to take care of them and get a performance boost with FSR. However, I went a slightly different direction and turned up to the high quality preset. This dropped averages a little to 40, but lows were still above 30 and I had a pretty tolerable racing experience. On the other side of the performance coin, I don't think anyone would expect a laptop with these specs to pull a rabbit out of the hat in Plague Tale Requiem, but I was able to get something close to a playable experience. Granted, it was at 720 low, with the CPU intensive settings also reduced, and with resolution optimizer set to balanced, but averages were in fact above 30 FPS, and 1% lows were probably best not talked about. And I don't think anyone will be too shocked to see a similar result in The Last of Us. Although this time I didn't need to use any further upscaling, 720 very low once more only delivered a slightly better than 30 FPS experience, and lows dropped below 20. You could probably get a locked 30 with some moderate FSR, but the game looks soft enough already. Resident Evil 4 Remake performs surprisingly well here, though not without making some sacrifices. Uh, no, not that guy. The performance preset can deliver just a frame or two shy of a 50fps average, with lows of 32, but this did require dropping the texture setting to get the memory usage out of the red. Cyberpunk wasn't playing ball, and I don't think the GPU was solely to blame. At 1080 low with balanced FSR, the game averaged 29 FPS with lows in the teens, mostly down to this particular intersection where frame rates just get hammered. This is a CPU intensive area, and clearly the somewhat nerfed i7 7700HQ just can't keep up. The Witcher 3's CPU demands are also pretty high, though it was possible to get a semi-acceptable frame rate. Again, though sacrifices had to be made. Resolution dropped to 720 and quality preset to low was sufficient for a slightly wobbly 30 frames per second. You might well say that DX11 would have been a better choice than DX12, but for whatever reason the system crashed both times I tried that out. A better option might be to roll back to the non-remastered version. Halo Infinite has a pretty heavy-handed approach to level of detail culling when using low-spec hardware. In the worst case scenario, I've seen it fail to render whole buildings. This wasn't quite as bad as that, but I'm sure the artists never really intended their trees to look like this. Again, I was unable to change the output resolution thanks to that desktop bug, hence why the output is 1440p, but with scaling dropped to 1080, the game ran at about 30fps with cinematic 1% lows. Dropping the scale to the minimum value of 54% of 1440p was much more playable, averaging 39. Elden Ring's low preset is distractingly ugly, especially the shadows and vegetation, but at 1080p anything higher is simply unplayable. Medium gives a 30 plus average, but the frame time graph is all over the place, even when nothing new is being rendered. Dropping quality to low smooths out the graph and gives a much more enjoyable 39fps with about 27fps lows. So, uh, I guess I'm a bit out of the loop in Fortnite, but even in performance mode there are some areas of the map which are now far more demanding on hardware than others. Any of the jungle sections of the map render at less than 80fps on average, whereas other areas can reach over 100. Either way, lows are ridiculous, spiking to below 30fps with annoying regularity. Finally, a new one for my low spec reviews, Battlebit Remastered is in early access and so performance is likely to change in the future. 
The game does have a potato quality setting, but mercifully it wasn't necessary. Even at low, the XPS could produce 100 FPS, and the 1%s were mm, not great. Some of those dips into the 30s occurred while respawning, but not all of them. One of the early use cases I had for this laptop, which I never really took advantage of, was emulation. Now, it's a thorny issue to cover emulation these days, especially now that the second place console brand is getting overly litigious, so forgive me if I use coded language in this section. 8-bit and 16-bit consoles are, of course, no issue for this hardware. In fact, all of the 90s consoles should work just fine, even up to the Killjoy 64. Instead, I wanted to focus on machines from the 2000s, where stuff gets interesting in the emulation landscape, and the throttled down i7-7700HQ is potentially going to cause problems in some of the more demanding emulators. First, PS2. The PCSX2 emulator isn't the most user-friendly I've ever used, and I did struggle somewhat with some of the controller binds also being keybinds for things like speeding up emulation or switching from full screen to windowed, but I eventually got it sorted out. At three times native resolution, Resident Evil 4 looks reasonably sharp and detailed and runs at a solid 60fps. Onto Dolphin, and Rogue Leader for the GameCube performs okay for the most part. Neither Vulcan nor OpenGL will get past the mission briefing, but DX12 at three times native resolution worked just fine. Once explosions have been cached, there's less slowdown, but for the first few seconds of gameplay, things do chug from time to time. That aside, gameplay is a mostly smooth 60fps. The only Wii game I had to hand was uh, Plumber Galaxy, which was also running very smoothly, though it has a weird thing where some sections will upscale, but others won't. I don't know why, and I'm not invested enough in space plumbers to try and find out. As for newer generation consoles, I had less luck. I couldn't get RPCS3 to even load an ISO, but I have reason to believe PS3 wouldn't run well on this system anyway. Xenia Canary runs the Xbox 360 version of Red Dead Redemption at 720p just fine, some of the time. Other times it'll drop below 20 FPS and become an absolute pain in the ass to play. CMU can run the Wii U version of every open world RPG for the last six years at about 30 FPS, but only at native resolution and only by using the FPS Plus hack, which also breaks some of the scenery, and even then, it's not a solid 30. The value of the 2017 XPS 15 on the used market right now is between £300 and £400, but my first port of call will be CEX. The trade-in value there is still pretty good, and I'm only going to spend the money on more tech to review, or maybe to upgrade my personal rig. In fact, I'll put up a community poll at the same time as this video to find out what you guys think I should do with the proceeds. Thanks for watching, kindly do the usual YouTube things if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you next time.